first speaker here, uh, Manuel Paes. Manuel is a co-author of the book Team Topologies, Organizing Business and Technology Teams for Fast Flow, and an IT organizational consultant and trainer. Uh, welcome to the stage, Manuel. Uh, we're looking forward to your talk about bringing Tetris under cognitive load. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a really pleasure to be um, at the Craft Conference. Uh, the program is always top notch every year. And I just looked at the same time as I'm speaking, you have Pat Kua and um, Liz Rice. So that's, uh, that's amazing. Um, so let me then get started with the talk. So I'm here to speak a little bit about playing Tetris with cognitive load and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, very quickly, my background is in as computer um, is in computer science. I've had a number of different roles over my career, starting as a developer, build manager, tester, etc. Um, obviously, today I'm mostly known for being one of the co-authors of the book Team Topologies. It was published in late 2019, um, has been very well received, uh, which is is really uh, refreshing, and. Really, the goal of the of the book was to kind of condense some of the patterns and ways of thinking about organi organizing teams and communication between teams that um, we saw working in, in our consulting experience. So I hope everyone has played tennis, everyone who's watching or at least know what uh, has played Tetris, sorry, or at least knows what Tetris is. Um, otherwise, I'm going to feel very old. Um, older than, than already filled. Um, but basically, it's this very simple game. You have pieces with different uh, shapes coming in from the top, and you have to um, organize them so that you complete lines and you can continue to play, right? If, you, if the pieces pile up to the top, then it's game over. Um, super simple, super addicting, at least um, when I was younger. And what I'm trying to do with, with this talk is let's think about the Tetris canvas as the, the cognitive load on a team, right? Let's imagine that that space is the, the total capacity of a team, um, their cognitive capacity. And then let's say the pieces are the different competencies that we're asking from teams, right? Um, for modern software, you would expect teams to know about CICD, infrastructure scores, security aspects, um, and a lot more, right? So just Go along with me, and let's let's assume Tetris is is represents the cognitive load of a of a given software delivery team. And for any modern software delivery team, there's already uh, quite a large number of technology and practices that we expect them to to know about, from obviously architecture, design, uh, but you know CI/CD infrastructure, testing. How do we deploy? How do we run? our services and our software um, in the live environment. So there's, there's already a quite a fair amount of skills and, and competencies that we expect from teams, but it's still looking at building the product right. So it's assuming we know what we should be building, that we're building the right things for our users, and then how do we do that? We need all these this skills, right? Um, if we actually have teams focus on what should we build, what are the features, what are what is the product that our customers are actually willing to um, pay for, are willing to engage with with our product, and therefore uh, you know uh, meet the the interest of the organization. And John Cutler, who is a product management guru, so I often reference him. Um, he talks, you know, kind of very straightforward, but if you want great products, you need empowered, fully cross-functional teams. Um, so why is he saying this? Well, one of the, the key reasons is that the teams need to be able to uh, discover, do the discovery process on what do customers need? What are the problems they have? How will the software and whatever features and uh, we provide, how is it going to actually help the, the customers and the users achieve their, their goals and, and the jobs they need to do? And so from that perspective, we start adding up some more skills and competencies for this sort of empowered uh, cross-functional teams, right? You would need a range of skills around product development, uh, business awareness, uh, you know, understanding viability of products and services, metrics, uh, customer satisfaction, all these things. And that's when we can start having some sort of 
understanding if we're building the right product. That we're not just sort of taking um, kind of product orders, if you like, and build those and, and just focus on delivering what others ask us to do, but actually understanding is this meeting the, the, the needs of the customers and therefore being actually um, helpful for the organization. So going back to the Tetris game, you know, we started with sort of more technical aspects uh, uh, in modern software delivery lifecycle. Um, and then now we're saying, well, we also need other things like user understanding user experience, understanding the metrics, not just of the, the, um, the system metrics, but actually the more of the business metrics, you know, who is using our features? How are they using them? Is that in how we expected or in a different way? Um, you know, what do, what should we do next to actually try to get the users to um, engage more or to change the, their behavior or to better understand what we're trying to offer them? Um, so we start adding all these things. You know, understanding viability of product. You know, understanding also the the costs, not just the the expected um, benefit. Um, looking at customer satisfaction, et cetera. So it starts to get, you know, really complicated and our cognitive load of a team can quickly become, um, you know, capacity become, become fully used and we, we're not able as a team anymore to actually do uh, proper discovery and, and delivery of the software. And you could even add here other aspects that take on part of the team's cognitive capacity. For example, when you're introducing new um, methodologies, we're introducing new new ways of working. And obviously, you know, things like Agile, DevOps, SRE are all have great benefits, well, but we should be aware that when we're asking teams to do, you know, introduce new practices, introduce new ideas, that's also taking up some of their cognitive load. How are we going to balance that, right? We can't just keep adding, adding, because then, you know, it's game over, it's, it gets very messy. So, should we give up and say, well, there's no way we're going to deal with this uh, problem uh, and, and, you know, it's just game over? Well, um, that wouldn't be very good because then I would only be uh, one third through my talk and it would be over. So um, there are, there are way, things we can think about. Um, and that's one of the, the key aspects in, in team topologies is how do we deal with this cognitive load uh, on teams that are supposed to be cross-functional are supposed to be empowered and have end-to-end -end ownership of their uh, service or product. And to do that, we need to dig a bit deeper into what is actually uh, team cognitive load. And when we understand that better, then we'll be able to make some decisions. And so cognitive load is um, comes from cognitive load theory from the field of psychology. Uh, for an individual, it's the total amount of mental effort being used in the working memory. Uh, this was defined by John Sweller, psychologist. <clears throat> so we can think from a team perspective is the, the total capacity of the team to deal with, the, with the, um, the tasks that are being asked and how much of their mental effort and capacity is being uh, used. Um, and so team cognitive load is something we introduced in the book. It's not something that is, um, it's, it's actually, being researched right now by, by people like John Sweller, like cognitive load applied to groups of people, not to individuals. Uh, but we can all understand that a team has a limited, a finite capacity in terms of how much they can deal with. So we can actually separate into three different types of cognitive load, which depends on what is the perspective of a team, what is the purpose of a team. So from, a, let's say, software delivery team perspective, we have intrinsic cognitive load. This has to do with all the skills and uh, competencies that are expected from the team to be able to deliver their work. So, you know, if we are working with a job application, maybe for banking uh, or something like that, then we need to know how to program in Java, how do we define classes and, and tests and, and all these sorts of things will, would be intrinsic, right? If we don't know how to do this for whatever reason, then it's gonna take up some of our uh, cognitive uh, and mental capacity. Then we have extraneous cognitive load. So again, from a software delivery perspective, this might be all the tasks that are sort of superfluous, things that need to happen, but are not direct, directly related to the problem we're trying to solve. So if I need to remember how do I deploy the application or where was the staging environment, how do I access the staging environment, 
or how where do I go to monitor the, the metrics of, of my service? All of these things will take up some of our capacity and are extraneous. And finally, the third one is germane type of cognitive load. So again, in the example of working some banking application, we would need to know things about the business domain, right? How the bank accounts work, how the bank transfers work, uh, and a lot of other things, right? Um, and what are the, our customers trying to do with this with this system or service? So we can sort of generalize to, to some extent the three different types of cognitive load into intrinsic, all the skills we need uh, in the team, extraneous, all the mechanics, the things that need to happen to actually deliver the value. And germane is everything focused on the, on the problem and the solution space, right? Everything around the actual business domain uh, that we should know in order to make better decisions and better implementations um, of, the, of the features or uh, what we're providing to, to customers. Once we understand that, that there are th these three different types of cognitive load, then we can aim to increase the germane and minimize extraneous intrinsic cognitive load. So for intrinsic cognitive load, we have a number of, of techniques. You know, we can do sort of classical training. We can do pair programming with someone more senior, helping someone more junior, um, mob programming, mentoring, uh, code reviews. All of this can help with reducing intrinsic cognitive load. Um, the extraneous is where there's often not as much clarity and people tend to think about, okay, automation and tooling is gonna help. And yes, to some extent, but that's not the full picture. It can actually, if we introduce tools in a way that is not helpful, they can actually increase the cognitive load. It's one more thing we have to worry about with this new tool or this new framework. Um, and so from a team perspective, we want to maximize their capacity to focus on the germane aspects, to focus on, on the actual problems of the customers uh, that we're trying to solve. And so I'm going to talk about three ways in which we can start to tame cognitive load, if you like, minimize the, the, the types of cognitive load that are not um, helpful to achieve better uh, products and, and services. So the first thing is just to make that an explicit um, concern. If we can ask the teams, what are the things that are difficult? What are the things that you feel you're not don't have the necessary skills or things that are taking up too much of your of your time? Um, and also, how well does the team understand the systems or services that they're responsible for? Um, we know that for those full, you know, empowered cross-functional teams, they need to be um, to be um, owning the services. So each service must be fully owned by a team with sufficient cognitive capacity to build, operate, but also you know, test, uh, release, support to this service. So we have one very simple kind of um, assessment, which is in fact more of a conversation starter, which you can um, find in, in that link. And I will um, share some, some resources at the end. Um, where we can actually have a simple survey asking teams, you know, what is the experience of building, testing, deployment? What are the things that are painful? Uh, what are the things that maybe you lack uh, understanding? Also, from a business perspective, obviously it has to be contextual, but, you know, if we're, for example, working in healthcare uh, um, environment, you know, do you understand enough about regulations around health, uh, the health industry? And is that something that is, you know, maybe you need to increase your, your knowledge around that? So it needs to be contextualized, but we can ask teams sort of what are the problems they have today? What is difficult in their day-to-day um, -day work and, and achieving their, their goals? So we make that explicit. And then we can look at the software and also try to arrange the software in, in team-sized chunks, sort of speak. So we should be looking at limiting the size of software services or products to the cognitive load that the team can handle. Right. Um, so we, we start having this sort of mapping of one service is fully owned by a single team that has enough capacity to uh, really you know, build, operate, understand and support this service. When you do that, you will tend to have system architectures that look more like on the right side with a team first approach to how we split, you know, maybe a monolith or maybe some large uh, other uh, type of large system. 
And we start to have uh, systems that are more aligned to teams and where different pieces have more kind of more similar size, right? So on the left, you have the traditional subsystem boundaries where often, you know, there's lack of clarity, who is responsible for what part of the system, people left or teams were disbanded and now the team that created the, that part of the system no longer exists. So it gets very confusing very quickly. And so on the right side might be what we get when we're trying to break down a monolith with a team first perspective, right? So we're not even talking about microservices yet. Maybe that will be helpful, but sort of a, a, a previous step is thinking about what are the, the sizes, the pieces that make sense to allocate to different teams also because they're mostly independent, right? So we want to look into that as well. Uh, parts of the system that fit the cognitive capacity of the team and are mostly independent from the, the other parts. And finally, and this is the, the main um, approach I want to talk about today, is looking at the right team topologies. Um, so teams don't work in isolation, right? And especially when we want to address cognitive load, we need to think about the sort of the team of teams, the ecosystem of teams. How do different teams help each other minimize the, the cognitive load or at least balance it out in, in a more effective way? So the word topology actually means the way different parts of a system are, are arranged or are interrelated. So we're applying this to teams, right? So um, which teams, which type of team should we have and how are they related and how should they interact in order to achieve um, our goals in terms of delivering products and services while keeping cognitive load under control? So we start with a stream-aligned team. This is sort of, that sort of cross-functional product team that um, John Cutler talks about. Effectively, a team with end-to-end -end ownership of a service, right? So they not only can uh, deliver changes with, more, with high autonomy, meaning with, without uh, much dependency on other teams, um, but also they should be able to support their service and take feedback into the, the next iterations of the service. So you can look at this as the build and run teams that we hear about in, in DevOps as well, um, but maybe even further uh, extended where the teams not just are, have ownership of build and run, but actually ownership of what should we build. Remember, what, how do we discover what the customers actually need, what helps the customers um, engage more with our, our service and, and do their jobs. And so there are different names for this type of teams, uh, product teams, cross-functional teams, uh, build and run. But effectively, we needed something that was less attached to product because product is also sort of overloaded term and it can be a very large product where you have many teams working on different streams, right? Um, but it's that, that type of team. And what we would expect in most organizations is to have mostly teams that are aligned, that are stream aligned um, with this end-to-end -end ownership at least if we want to achieve fast flow, if we want to uh, be able to respond very quickly to changes in what the, the customers are asking us, respond very qu quickly to changes in, in technology and also uh, responding to incidents and problems uh, very quickly. So when we're saying quickly, we're saying, you know, in a matter of uh, um, hours or under an hour if possible. So obviously you need a lot of the, the technical um, competencies in place, things like continuous uh, delivery, things like, you know, test automation, uh, different, you know, deployment strategies, et cetera. All that sort of is a prerequisite. But um, we, if we want fast flow in organization responding quickly to change, then we need mostly streamlined teams with end-to-end -end ownership. But we go back to the Tetris problem, right? The cognitive load is too high. We're asking a lot of things from, from a single team. Um, and that's where the other types of teams come in. So we start with enabling team. Enabling teams, um, the goal is to reduce the learning curve for teams to acquire new capabilities. There uh, are usually small teams of experts in some domain. And so their goal is to teach and mentor the stream aligned teams um, in particular. And so we make it much more intentional and much faster for stream aligned teams to achieve and to gain new capabilities and awareness compared to just letting them to their own devices and you know, you know, learn on the go or learn on your free time, that's not really um, acceptable and it's not intentional enough, right? Um, so we understand that 
the knowledge in teams keeps evolving, technology keeps evolving. So we need ways to keep up with that, with that uh, demand. So that's probably gonna help us reduce a little bit cognitive load by having teams with the necessary skills. Um, so we might have enabling teams around things like, you know, some organizations, there's a lack of uh, skills around mobile development. So maybe our mobile developers, instead of working uh, overtime on, you know, the different mobile apps, maybe they could be enabling other teams to, to know enough to, to do that sort of development themselves. And many other areas that we might have enabling teams around user experience or even product development and um, things like that, whatever we have gaps in our teams. Another type of team is platform. Um, and platform teams provide services that enable the streamlined teams to deliver work with more autonomy, substantial autonomy. Um, so what, what do we mean specifically like that by, the, by this? Because platform is also a very overloaded term. So we adopted the definition from Evan Butcher. He's a head of engineering at ThoughtWorks in Australia. And he's saying a digital platform is a foundation of self-service APIs, tools, services, knowledge, and support arranged as a compelling internal product. So there's a lot here to unpack. Um, I'd like to, to highlight some of these aspects. First, self-service. So if we want to help accelerate our uh, internal teams, our streamlined teams, if the, the platform is based on, on requests, on tickets that we respond to, that's not going to help them very much. It's a, it's a blocking dependency. It's the, the digital platform, the modern platform, needs to be self-service. Otherwise, we, we're introducing more delays. Uh, it's, there's also an aspect of knowledge and support, meaning that it's not just the technology, it's not just the features we're providing the platform, it's actually how we arrange the, the support around it, how we make the knowledge around uh, the platform easy to, to understand and to consume by, by uh, other teams, right? So it means, obviously, that we need some sort of platform team as well um, to provide that and care about that. And finally, everything arranged as a compelling internal product. That means we shouldn't be mandating the platform services to other teams because that kind of sets the wrong incentives in terms of uh, teams starting to focus a lot on building more features, de deploying, uh, delivering more uh, functionality, when in fact that might not be helping reduce cognitive load. If we're providing more things in the platform, but the, the teams are supposed to consume them don't understand or don't find them easy to use, then we're actually introducing more, um, more cognitive load, more problems for the streamlined teams, especially if we are mandating the platform. So instead, we need to have this product focus for the platform, just like we do with customer-facing uh, products that we, do, that we um, built. So customers are internal, but should be the same product focus. So now we start to reduce the, the, the cognitive load on, on the teams again by having this, this useful abstractions in the self-service approach in the platform. So teams can do things like deploying, monitoring, um, provisioning in ways that are much simpler for them. Uh, that's, that's kind of what the, the goal. So if we have a proper self-service platform, it's almost like some of these pieces in, in the Tetris don't even enter the game, right? These are hidden in the platform. We don't have to worry about them. So it makes it easier to, to play the cognitive load game. Uh, less, less moving pieces, more predictable, less contact switching between you know, a whole number of, of, of tools and a whole number of different practices and so on. And finally, the last, the fourth type of team are complicated subsystem teams. And so these are very particular and we um, actually don't recommend unless you really feel the need. But there are situations where you need these teams to build and evolve part of a system which requires very specialized PhD type of knowledge. So it's not the traditional component team that you say, well, this is a component around this technology, so we have a team dedicated. Um, that's not what we're talking about. But in some cases, you know, maybe, for example, face recognition uh, subsystem or um, real-time financial trading, where this is part of a, of a larger service, but it's too complicated for a single streamlined team to own, right? So we actually need a dedicated team to, to work on this. And again, the reason is to reduce cognitive load on the streamlined team that uses this complicated subsystem. 
um, and which might mean that we only have one consumer of this complicated subsystem, and that's okay because the goal is to reduce their cognitive load. It's not necessarily to share this subsystem with many teams. In fact, that becomes a, a possible bottleneck for delivery. Effectively, if we say, if we leave up to a streamlined team to, you know, you have to deal with this very complicated subsystem, then we're, it's almost like we're throwing, I don't know, 10 pieces of Tetris uh, in the game at the same time. This is this very complicated part that now you need to deal with and, and makes it very hard to actually focus on, on customers as well and focus on the end-to-end -end, um, service. And finally, we've looked at the four fundamental types of teams and how the three sort of supporting types of teams help reduce cognitive load on the streamlined teams. But we also need more clarity on the interactions between these teams, right? Um, that's also something we've identified as a frequent problem. Teams don't know how to um, interact with other teams or even with, with which teams they should be interacting. So in team topologies, we define three very clear interaction modes. Um, collaboration, where we have two teams working together for a defined period of time. So it's not sort of open-ended as we often see, is actually we're gonna to work together for two weeks or uh, for two months in order to find a solution to some problem or kind of design um, some, some API that you know, one team is gonna consume and the other is going to provide. Whatever it is that we need the two teams together to be efficiently um, finding a solution to, to this problem. Um, X as a service is very much in line with infrastructure as a service, software as a service, where we're saying one team, usually a platform team, provides a service that one or more teams consume, right? So if that service is mature enough, the documentation, the support is there, uh, and the service is reliable, then we don't actually expect interaction to happen. If we just expect other teams can consume them um, autonomously. And finally, facilitating is typical for enabling teams, but can happen between other types of teams as well, where one team has some more expertise on some domain and they're helping another team gain those skills and sort of um, um, improve their awareness on some, some domain. And so with the four types of teams and the three interaction modes, we can also start have this sort of um, view on which teams exist in organization uh, what type of teams are they? What are they trying to achieve? How are these teams interacting? So this is a, a snapshot that we can take in, in, at any moment in time and understand from a, an organizational perspective, what are we trying to achieve? Which services are we building for our customers? How are, you know, which platform services are we working on? Maybe there's some collaboration going on with Streamline team on a new, I don't know, monitoring service or some new feature that we want to include in the platform. Um, and we have maybe in, some enabling teams helping facilitate knowledge and, and so on. So this is a snapshot and obviously we'll see this evolve over time, but at least gives us a view on um, what are the capabilities and what are we trying to do um, today in this part of the organization and how is this gonna, we expect this to evolve over time. Um, collaboration might become access as a service because we've sort of worked out what the features should look like and now they're available for any team to use um, and so on. This changes over time. Fundamentally, what we found, and we actually tried uh, hard to think as we were writing the book, are there other fundamental types of teams that, or interaction modes that don't fit this sort of larger patterns that we talk about? Um, and we didn't really come up with, with something significant. So um, with these four fundamental topologies and the three interaction modes, we can um, achieve and deal with a lot of the uh, difficulties and certainty today in modern software systems. And the fact that teams are often overloaded with so many skills that are required for them. Uh, they're being pulled in so many directions, asked to, to care about so many things without actually being given the proper support and proper um, tools in terms of you know, um, internal organizational support to, to make that happen uh, effectively. So to sum up, I talked about, I started by explaining why teams tend to have too high cognitive load if we're, they're just left to their own devices and being asked to do more and more. So to address that, we can start by intentionally um, 
making content load explicit, talking to teams, understanding what are the difficulties, what are the things that are consuming a lot of their effort. Um, then we need to look at the architecture as well. I didn't go into a lot of detail, but thinking about you know team size, software, and architecture versus you know sort of uh, random um, dependencies between teams that accrued over time, we should be more intentional uh, about how we set up uh, the software architecture based on uh, the team's capacities. And finally, we looked at team topologies and interactions and how that effectively are intentional mechanisms to address too high cognitive load, to help teams uh, learn the skills and have the support in terms of services that are useful to accelerate and, and allow them to have uh, less to worry about, have a simpler um, Tetris game, if you like. And we can't pause the cognitive load on teams, right? We can't just say, let's you know stop now and, and come back later. Um, but we, like I said, you can explicitly, explicitly start to address it, uh, minimize it with different types of teams um, and look at the ecosystem of all the teams together as that's what's going to allow you to keep the overall cognitive load under control and, and sort of balanced, right? As I said, we have a number of, of resources you know, on our website, topologies.com, um, and also some of these tools like the, the cognitive load assessment. Uh, you can find another templates to do some of these things and help teams uh, define their, their, um, their roles, their team APIs, et cetera. We also have started an academy. So this is on-demand live training for people who want to go more in-depth um, besides the book. Thank you very much. And I think we have time for questions now. That was amazing. Thank you very much. That was, that was great stuff. Uh, yes, we do have time for questions. And we already have a few questions lined up, actually. Um, there is a little bit of delay between when you talk and when it shows up in the stream. So we'll make sure to leave a little time for more questions to come in. Okay. But, um, but for the ones that are here already, uh, Fabian is asking, um, organizing teams better sounds great at the org level. Do you have any tips for taming cognitive load at the team level, for example, at a smaller scale? Yes, that's a great question. And effectively, um, it's interesting because different different people with different sort of roles tend to um, start with team topologies with different aspects. So, for example, at the team level, we have what we call a team API, which is obviously based on, on the, the term application programming interface, but for teams. So if we can better define what is our interface as a team, how do we prefer to communicate with others? Uh, what are the things we're working on? What are the practices that we adopt? Um, at least you're helping other teams reduce the cognitive load in their interactions with you as a team, right? So that's one example. Um, inside the team, I think you depends obviously, but if you see that you know uh, there is maybe too much intrinsic cognitive load, for example, uh, inside uh, for different people, don't you don't have very uh, sort of uh, um, or in other words, if people are very specialized then inside the team, you might need to have some pairing between people or even mob programming um, and maybe you know, um, mentoring inside the team so that you help some of the people who are have less knowledge upskill so that overall inside the team, you have less dependencies between individuals, right? You have uh, the work able to uh, flow better because you know that most people can take a piece of work and sort of move it forward. But also when you find obstacles, you know, let's say maybe, uh, I don't know, someone doesn't know how to test automation for some, some new feature, then you also inside the team should have this, this approach of, okay, let's focus on getting over that obstacle. Instead of each one working on a separate thing and someone is blocked and you know they're just struggling, this team focus is also um, a team first mindset of we need to help the team as a whole move by helping this person who is struggling with this problem. So we definitely talk about that in, in the book as well. How, what is the expected behaviors for the team members to actually behave in, in a team first uh, approach, putting the team first. Outstanding, thank you for that very, uh, very in-depth answer. Yeah, that's, uh, it's interesting how you can apply some of the same principles at various levels of, of the organization. Um, we have more questions. 
Dominic is asking, uh, are ideas like DevOps counteracting a reasonable cognitive load of teams? It's a good question. It really depends how you approach it, right? So um, I've seen I've seen different different ways, and and so sometimes it's approached as well. We need some new tooling, and we see, need some new practices. In theory, this is going to help. But if the way you're introducing this is by just telling teams now you need to do infrastructure as code, now you need to use uh, I don't know Terraform or some other uh, new tool without providing the support for them to actually learn and perhaps some platform services that abstract some of the complexities, <clears throat> then we're not really helping them because we're increasing the cognitive load. Um, when it's more driven by, you know, let's look at what are the current challenges we have with, you know, going faster, delivering faster, or maybe having better uh, monitoring, have a better deployment, then it's a different approach. We start by looking at our internal problems and then look at which of these practices that we know about can help us and how do we adopt them in a gradual way that helps us um, start fixing the, the issues we have without just suddenly you know, increasing cognitive load uh, by, by uh, an order of magnitude. And perhaps one, the canonical example is maybe with Kubernetes, right? It's, it's great. It has a lot of amazing functionality um, and, and, and things it provides, but the way we introduce it, it can make it almost um, unusable, almost slow down teams to and almost to a stop if we're just telling them, uh, if we're telling a software delivery team, well, just read the, doc the Kubernetes documentation and start using it. That's like your head explodes unless you already have experienced people in the team. And so it's very important to start with cognitive load and your current challenges when introducing tooling, practices, et cetera. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, I think it also leads nicely to uh, this other question, um, which is, can you drive this change bottom up in an organization? Do you have any tips for selling these to decision makers? Um, we have infographics, <laughs> which tend to help for certain uh, certain levels. So on teamtopologies.com slash infographics, or you just look around, you'll find it. Uh, which sort of explain team topologies in a nutshell and what are the problems that it's addressing. But um, I think it can work bottom up. It depends what, what, your, you know, what is your starting point. But for example, even in a single team, like I said, you might adopt a team API to start with, and then you might start sort of familiarizing other teams with interaction modes, right? So when you have some piece of work where you depend on another team, you might say, you might reach out to them and say, hey, why don't we try to do this collaboration? Let's set a, um, expectations on how long we think this is going to last. What is exactly, exactly the outcome we were trying to achieve so that you know, we start to have a more um, well-defined interactions between teams. And so you start not only for your team to help you know, reduce ambiguity, reduce uh, problems within those interactions, but actually familiarizing other teams with these new interactions. And I don't think you need any kind of mandate or uh, approval to do that. It's just you're improving your own ways of working. Um, that said, obviously, there are some things that will need uh, kind of more senior management approval when we're talking about you know, introducing new types of teams or aligning two types of teams. Um, you know, that's, that's probably going to need um, other, other kinds of approval. But from an individual team perspective, I think there's a lot you can you can start with. Also internally, start thinking of how are you aligned, which type of team are you aligned to mostly? Are we mostly stream aligned team? What's stopping us from becoming more, more stream aligned? Uh, maybe we need some more competencies around product development, or we need, um, I don't know, some help from another team to, to gain some skills. So I think there's a lot you can do from a team perspective. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, Peter has a somewhat different, bit more practical question. Uh, do you have tips for planning next iterations or sprints across multiple teams? That is usually an indication that um, you probably have teams that are more coupled than you would like to. Um, and so, 
part of making this work is is you know like what um, the principles that you know Netflix talks about, where we have um, highly aligned teams, but with but loosely coupled. So that means we're aligned on what we're trying to achieve uh, for the organization and what kind of you know product services we're trying to 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 provide to customers, but we're loosely coupled. So that means we need to look from a product perspective: how do we break this down into different um, services that are more mostly independent? So we actually have a, um, another assessment that's called well, it's, it's a set of questions really: independent service heuristics. So if you go to um, teamtopologies.com slash tools, you'll find that where you can start thinking about, you know, from this large product, what are the sort of independent parts that we could maybe align teams uh, to these independent parts? Um, there will always be cross-cutting concerns, things like UX or, you know, the overall uh, reliability of, of the product. But you can start to address those with, with enabling and platform teams and have the streamlined teams focused on this vertical slice of the product. Um, but it requires thinking around how do we break up this large product into smaller chunks that are more or less independent. It's never 100%, but if 80% of the time a team can work independently and not have to coordinate with other teams, that's probably a pretty good, pretty good um, goal. We actually have an example in, in the book from IKEA where they, they got this problem where they had to sort of split a larger team in order to have smaller teams that were more independent. Um, but effectively, when people talk about software monolith, often there's a business monolith in there as well, right? So especially businesses that grew and, and were successful over time, we started building stuff into this single product or large system. And now, all, even from a business perspective, there's not a lot of clarity on what are the different kind of uh, streams of value for the business, right? So we need to look into that um, so that we avoid having those big coordinations between many teams. Right, so sometimes the answer is you shouldn't have to do that. <laughs> but I totally, yeah, but I totally understand that in many cases that's the reality now. Yeah. Um, I would also look into start tracking dependencies between teams, especially blocking dependencies. That means we're trying to deliver some work, but now we have to stop and wait for another team to do something for us. Because that's where you start getting all the, the a lot of the problems with you know dependencies, conflicts of priority, et cetera. And so that's another thing that any given team can start. You know, uh, we have another <laughs> little um, template for that in, in, in GitHub where you can start tracking your dependencies on other teams and sort of classifying them. Is this uh, okay dependency? It means you know now and then we need something from them, but it doesn't really stop us from doing our work. Is it more of a slowing dependency? It slows us down to some extent, or is it blocking? We actually, for this piece of work, we need to stop, wait for another team, and then come back. Um, those blocking dependencies, we can then start tracking and start to, to try to deal with that. And the interaction modes can help. So if, for example, we're always depending on another team to do a deployment of our service, can we talk to that team and say, you know, look, we think if we had two weeks together that, you know, you're helping us understand how deployments work, how this tooling uh, works, um, so that we can then do it by ourselves, then, you know, we are starting to reduce how many of these dependencies between teams we have, but also yeah. in the monolith as well, in the code as well, where we, we might want to collaborate with another team to actually understand what is the right boundary between us and separation of responsibilities. So that now after we collaborate, we can each be more independent. Amazing. Um... Uh, I'm afraid there's actually one more question, but we're slowly running out of time. Um, can you maybe talk very shortly about whether you think these topologies can work for companies that have a small engineering team, say 10 to 50 developers? Yeah, so I think what's important is the thinking around this. So you can have platform thinking and enabling thinking, even if you don't have a dedicated team in a very small mm -hmm. organization. but a platform can be just even a, a wiki page where you're saying we use maybe AWS and some other third-party services, but here's how we how we recommend using it. 
what are some good defaults, some good approaches. So you're already helping the teams reduce their cognitive load because they think, well, I need, I don't know, a new relational database. What should I do? Oh, I go to the platform definition and I see, well, we recommend using this AWS service and this is how you set it up, et cetera. So it already starts helping and enabling as well. You can have more experienced people in a startup helping the more junior people understand what do we do, what practices we follow. And they might not be a dedicated, um, you know, full-time working on that, but at least start dedicating some time to for enabling and for thinking about what is our platform and how do we help reduce cognitive load on, on our 10, 15 engineers, uh, because yep. it can quickly grow, right? And when you have periods of fast growth and you don't have that thinking in place, that's where the problems are going to grow. Yeah, absolutely. But I just want one, one last thing. I know that for people listening, a lot of what I'm saying is like, it sounds right, but it's difficult in practice. And I'm with you. I, I know these things are not easy. So I'm not, not um, don't be demotivated by, by that. It's some of these things take, take a long time. Yeah, but it's worth it. Um, thank you very much for your time. 